Welcome back to Judgment Decision Making. My name is Dr. Padilla. Today we're going to talk about jumping to conclusions. Now, one of the most important things about type one processing, is it has a tendency to neglect ambiguity. If you look at the top line here, you would probably read A, B, C. And if you looked at the bottom line, you might read 12, 13, 14, or 1, 2, 1, 3, 1, 4. But notice that the two center items are actually identical, but we perceive them as either being a B or a 13 because of context. So our type one fast processing system jumps to conclusions about what is likely to be between A and C and between 12 and 13 and just fills in the blanks for us. So we actually perceive information differently based on context. And this is how our type one system is always jumping to conclusions. We have a bias to confirm and believe, which is a really uh, an example of how we tend to jump to conclusions. You might see a statement like this that says, is Dr. Padilla a good professor? And when you hear that, you immediately start thinking of supporting evidence for that. You might think of examples of lectures that you liked or something about the class that you enjoyed. It is harder to automatically think of counterexamples. You have to deliberately try to think of counterexamples because we have a bias to confirm the information provided to us. If the question had been phrased differently, like, is uh, Dr. Padilla a horrible professor, you would have tried to think of evidence to support that statement. But the way that the question was framed leads you to think of positive things about me simply by the tendency for us to confirm information in our mind. Okay, here's a really great example. So here's an individual, his name is Alan. He's intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, stubborn, and envious. Now just think, what what is your interpretation of Alan? Just decide in your own head how you feel about this person, Alan. Now let's look at uh, another person. This gentleman's name is Ben. He's envious, intelligent, industrious, impulsive, critical, and stubborn. What do you think about Ben? What is your perception of Ben's character? When we compare these two, note that the only difference is the first word that has been presented to you. In Alan's case, we begin by telling you that he is intelligent. And when you hear the word intelligent, your type one processing system starts jumping to conclusions and decides that this person is likely uh, has qu positive qualities because he's intelligent. We like people that are intelligent. So we kind of um, flavor all of the following information in the light of being positive because we've already made assumptions about Alan from that very first description. Now, Ben, on the other hand, we first told you that he was envious. And so all of your interpretations of the following qualities are going to be in a negative tone because um, you first believe that he's envious and so now you're going to think different things about him. And this might lead to entirely different perceptions of who these people are. You might think of Alan as someone maybe like Ryan Gosling's character from The Notebook where he's spontaneous and intelligent, maybe stubborn and envious, but you know that's okay because he's overall a good character. Whereas Ben, you might think of him as a Ted Bundy-like character where he's envious and that's driving all of these other negative qualities and can lead to horrible things like mass murder. Okay, the next thing I want to talk about is the halo effect, which is related to this concept of type one thinking, jumping to conclusions. Now, I love Bill Murray. I love everything that Bill Murray is in. I've liked him from his early days in SNL. I loved basically every movie that he's in. So much so, when I was living in Evanston in Illinois, I tried to like the Cubs, and I don't know anything about sports, but I thought I'd become a sports fan simply because Bill Murray was such a big sports fan. And note, Bill Murray is in some horrible movies. They're really, really bad, some of them. Some of them are fantastic, but others can be really bad. And um, it doesn't really matter to me. I think Bill Murray's the best, and I'll like anything that he does. 
Okay, and so this is really the effect that leads people to be um, fully endorsing of a particular product line. Some people might be Apple people, and you end up getting all of the things produced by Apple. You might have the watch and the notebook and the iPad, and maybe not all of it's good. Maybe the watch is so-so, but you know, you have the, the MacBook Pro or whatever, and you're convinced that everything that they're producing is just a little bit better than what the competitors are producing. But the truth is, even if you have an iPhone, you don't necessarily need an iPad. You could go with a different type of tablet, but we have a tendency to glom onto a particular company because we think that everything that that company is producing is slightly better even though that's not necessarily the case. We jump to conclusions about the qualities of something that everything, that all of the products that a company is producing. And this is really why you see celebrities potentially getting into industries that they don't know or that, that wasn't their primary focus. So you have Yeezy uh, by Kanye West, you have Goop by Gwyneth Paltrow, Fenty by Rihanna. You can assume that maybe these stars have some type of background knowledge in these industries. That's absolutely fine, but it's certainly not what they became famous for. So it is interesting that um, part of the reason that these companies have been so successful is because of the fame of their spokesperson. If you happen to like Rihanna, you're more likely to take a look at her product line than Goop's product line if you are interested in Gwyneth Paltrow. So it's this really interesting thing where we attribute our like of Rihanna's music with the quality of her products, even though they are unrelated. Now, this is a really interesting one. And uh, you'll see me mention lots of YouTubers because I think uh, YouTube fame is very fascinating. And this particular um, young woman, Jojo Siwa, she had a really fascinating rise to fame. She was originally on a, a dancing, a kids dancing show, but got a lot of fame from this YouTube channel. And she, it's this really crazy YouTube channel for young girls where she's very high energy and yelling, which led to her making a massive amount of products, in particular bows for your hair. And so much so that her bows became so popular they were banned in certain classrooms because they were very, very expensive, like 30 bucks for just one bow. And so some kids could purchase these bows and other kids couldn't. And it was leading to all these issues in school because this individual had so much fame and so much influence on these small children that they had to have these bows. And there was, you know, fights in elementary schools about them. So that's to say that the people who are at highest risk of being influenced by this halo effect tend to be people who have less of a developed system to process. And kids are obviously that way. It takes a while for the front part of our brain to develop. It's actually the last part of our brain to develop. And so when you're a child, you can be very influenced um, by thinking that everything that your favorite YouTube star does is great or you absolutely must have this type of cereal because you saw it on a commercial. It is very hard for you to override that, that information as a young child and to think something different. So this is just a really interesting example of this. And um, now this, this young woman has um, a Tesla with her face on it <laughs> and uh, $14 million, which is really a testament to her ability to capture people's attention and have lots of young children really want her product because of the halo effect. Okay, so, but this has been going on for a long time. This is a um, example from my childhood where the um, Olsen twins, sorry, I just forgot their name. The Olsen twins become, became famous because they were on this TV show named Full House. They started endorsing these beauty products at a very young age, and now they are very famous fashion designers. And the interesting part and why I'm bringing them up is that they captured an audience that was at the time young and grew up with them. So the people that were buying their friendship spray and their hair twisters are now the same people 
who are buying their high-end couture clothing. So this has a very strong hold on us, this halo effect that can follow us for many years. And these are just two <laughs> outlandish examples. You know, the, the wrapper snacks um, are funny. And you might have heard things about GameStop stocks. So this is another example of this guy named Michael Burry, who was actually played by Christian Bale in a movie called The Big Short, which is fantastic. And be partly because of his fame um, in the movie and because he was one of the few people to call the original financial crisis, people are really paying attention to his actions. And he was one of the people that suggested individuals should buy stock in GameStop. GameStop. <laughs> and you can kind of learn more about what that, the implications of that. But because he endorsed the strategy of buying GameStop stock, lots of people on Reddit kind of got behind this activity. And um, now there's a whole fiasco going on about um, the, the rapid rise of GameStop stock and what that means for people who were betting against that stock. Okay, so this kind of leads me to this other principle, which is the Instagram effect. That's how I'm going to call it. It's basically the what you see is all there is effect. And, um, you know, it relates to type one thinking, how we jump to conclusions on the basis of limited evidence. And the reason I call this the Instagram effect <clears throat> is because I think you all know it slightly better than other generations that you can see pictures like this that look beautiful, lovely, serene, but they were actually created like this. You know, we are now aware that the information presented to us on the internet or through social and through social media are very curated and staged, but it's still hard to look at a picture like this and imagine the background scenario that was used to create it. Because we see this and assume this is everything, we can kind of speculate that there's more to it, but it's very hard for our mind to imagine the full um, scenario because we're only shown initial information. And you know, many stars are pushing back, to, uh, back on this. <laughs> um, you see stars like Zendaya kind of pushing back on Photoshopping because when you see a Photoshopped individual, it's hard to imagine what the reality is because all you see is all there is, you know? Um, so it's really great that stars are pushing back and trying to show the reality of, of what they look like so people can have accurate expectations. And I just thought this was a cute example um, where people are just kind of outlandishly using Photoshop <laughs> and um, kind of recognizing that we might make some assumptions about this scene and unless we look deeply into it, activate system two processing to kind of figure out if this is the reality, we're just going to assume that the picture was just a regular happy family portrait. Okay, and the last study that I want to point out here is a really great example from a, a scientific publication in which these researchers had two groups of people and they presented both groups with a scenario where an individual was going into a store and there was some disagreement about if they were allowed to go in the store or not. Now the first group received one-sided arguments about why this individual should be allowed to go in the store and talk to employees. And these one-sided arguments were biased in favor of one side or another. You can imagine you know, how lawyers will argue for one side or, or the other side. Well, they had groups that either heard arguments for side A and arguments for side B, okay? But they didn't hear both arguments. They only heard one-sided arguments. And they tended to be more confident in their decision of who was right in this event and less accurate, meaning that people who only heard one side of an argument were convinced that they were right and they happen to be the least correct out of um, the, the different groups. So when you're prevent, presented with little information, you don't know enough to, to understand if you're correct or not, but you assume you do. So often the less information you have, 
the more confident you are in your choices. Okay, and then the second group received both arguments and they were more able to predict the outcome of the case. Now, this is really just one study of a large body of research that looks at this. And, um, you know, if you're more interested in it, please reach out to me. I have lots of different citations for fascinating work that looks at the kind of the impact of these um, different framing of arguments. Okay, summary for what we've learned today. Uh, ambiguity neglect is using ambiguous information to confirm a narrative. Bias to believe and confirm is when we seek confirmation of information rather uh, than try to disprove our beliefs. And I think this is really important today because we're often presented with media that is confirming what we believe. It is so easy to create algorithms that serve you information that is consistent with your beliefs. And that contributes to how hard it is for us to think of counter evidence. So it always seems like we're right. And it seems ridiculous that anyone else could believe something else. And it's partly because we have this bias to believe and confirm and partly because we're never provided with counter evidence unless we directly seek it out. The halo effect is uh, if you like something, you will like everything associated with it. And the Instagram effect is what you see is all there is.